Hi, good afternoon. Let me try that again. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Corey Cook. I'm the Dean of the School of Public Service here at Boise State University. Uh, it's my great honor and pleasure to welcome you to our inaugural Frank Tersh Lecture. Uh, we have, for the first time at Boise State, an endowed chair in the social sciences. A lot of people, probably, I mean literally hundreds of people, work to make that happen in establishing the Frank and Bethine Church Chair in Public Affairs. Uh, we're joined today by our first chairholder, Steve Feldstein. Uh, Steve joined us at Boise State this fall from the United States Department of State. Uh, there he served as a Deputy, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State uh, for, let me get this right, Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. His portfolio included Human Rights Policy for Africa, International Labor Affairs, and International uh, Religious Freedom. Uh, prior to serving in the Department of State, he was the Director of Policy for USAID, and prior to that, he served as a counsel to the United States Senate uh, Committee on Foreign Relations. Uh, since he's been on campus, Steve and his, and his wife have made a, a profound impact since they've been here. Uh, we're extremely excited to have him on campus and to help build uh, the, the Global uh, Studies Program that he's affiliated with, as well as to expand the reach of the Frank Church Institute. We have a handful of Frank Church uh, Institute board members in attendance today. I want to thank our board for everything they did. This was a 20-year endeavor, I understand, creating this chair. A lot of effort, a lot of fundraising, a lot of work to make this happen. Uh, to, to paraphrase a former boss of yours, this is a, a big deal. Uh, I, won't, I won't give the direct quote. <laughs> There's an, I think I missed a word, but in any case, this is a big deal. And, and we, are, we are certainly excited uh, to, have, to have Steve on campus. So with that, uh, Please welcome C. Feldstein. Thank you. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And, and um, also, I know that my former title at the State Department can be a little tricky to say. Uh, a few times when I was doing diplomacy in Africa, people would introduce me as the, you know, Mr. Honorable Secretary of State Stephen Feldstein. I'd say, wait a second, that's not really what I, it's a little bit higher than my rank, but, you know, sometimes you have to go with these things. You don't want to embarrass your hosts. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm honored to deliver a lecture on behalf of the Frank Church Institute. Uh, and as you know, Eliz Elizabeth and I uh, recently moved to Boise. Uh, we've moved here in July from Washington, D.C. with our 15-month-old son, uh, and we've already experienced an exceedingly warm welcome. Uh, we started to get to know the community, uh, and we had the opportunity to travel around the state uh, to catch them in Sun Valley, McCall, Stanley, and the Sawtooth, and of course, the Bethine and Frank Church scenic overlook. Uh, Idaho is stunning, and we feel very lucky to live in such a magnificent state. Uh, today, I want to talk about public leadership uh, in a time of great turbulence and uncertainty. There have been other moments in our nation's history when we have grappled with large and difficult questions about the future. But I think what makes this moment especially unique uh, is that events are moving more quickly in a more disorienting fashion than we've seen before. As I was looking through the Frank Church archives, I came across a joke he occasionally told. Quote, there's a story of an airline pilot who announced to his passengers that he had two pieces of news for them, one bad and the other good. The bad news, he said, is that we are lost. The good news is that we are traveling at a record-breaking rate of speed. <laughs> this feels appropriate for our time. Uh, for those who have a college education and live in, and live in a city, life is pretty good. Innovation is moving at a rapid pace, Self-driving cars are around the corner. Algorithms can predict when a customer is ready to buy a new product, when a jet engine needs servicing, or if a person may be at, may be at risk for disease. Unemployment is low. Housing prices have recovered. Median income is rising. And health outcomes are improving. On the other hand, in the face of rapid and overwhelming economic, social, and technological change, cultural retrenchment is, is also taking hold. Blue-collar work is disappearing. A high school education gets you very little beyond a service industry job. Identity politics and polarization are growing. Many communities, especially those in more isolated and rural areas, are fearful and mistrusting of the future. This spring and summer, we witnessed neo-Nazis and white supremacists marching by torchlight through southern college towns. We've, been, we've seen skirmishes break out across the country, from Berkeley to Boston. Uh, we've watched right-wing militia members square off against black bloc anarchists. 
But this turbulence is not limited to political volatility. Our environment is changing in alarming and disturbing ways as well. Take this past summer. I remember waking up in June to the following headline, quote, an iceberg the size of Delaware just broke away from Antarctica. The warnings are coming at a dizzying pace. Permafrost in Alaska that is thawing, fires burning across Greenland at a rate unmatched in 10,000 years. Here in Idaho, we're living with our own version of climate change. July was the second hottest summer on record, with 32 consecutive days above 90 degrees. And just as the heat started to ease, we confronted an, un an unprecedented fire season that rained ash in Portland and brought purple air quality warnings to the Treasure Valley. Every five years, the National Intelligence Council comes out with a strategic futures report that looks 20 years ahead. The title of the most recent report is The Paradox of Progress. It notes how fragile our achievements are, that our progress has also spawned major shocks. The Arab Spring, 2008 global financial crisis, the resurgence of populism. While humans are more interconnected, empowered, and prosperous than ever before, glaring differences over ideas and identity are increasing, and the human impact on the planet is catching up to us. So what does this portend for the United States? The subject I want to address today is U.S. leadership. It's a topic that I've given a lot of thought to, especially since I left public service in January of this year. I'm concerned that we are facing a vacuum in leadership at precisely the moment that we need it the most. Those who are in charge, starting with President Donald Trump, are deliberately steering the country in a reckless and dangerous manner. We are actively embracing destructive policies that are hemorrhaging our future. In a speech Frank Church, Frank Church gave in Sun Valley in 1972, he decried, too many status quo politicians driving right down the middle of the road. He lambasted the establishment for being unwilling to deal with the real problems in America, the denial of equal treatment on account of race and sex, a pointless and prideful war, economic inequality, and little progress cleaning up the environment and dealing with pollution. The ruptures and divisions Church identified in 1972 clearly resonate today. And I would like to, to lay out three challenges that require exceptional leadership, if not from within our government, than from a broader citizenry. Uh, first, the erosion of public trust in U.S. democracy. Second, the onset of rapid environmental disruption brought on by climate change. Third, the startling diminish diminishment of U.S. standing in the world, which puts our interests and national security at risk. First, the erosion of public trust in democracy. Democracy in the U.S. is under duress, and the data is troubling. The Pew Foundation has conducted trust in government surveys since 1958. In 1958, Approximately three-quarters of Americans trusted the federal government to do the right thing almost all of the time. Starting in the 1960s, that trust in government started to erode. Since 2007, the share of Americans who say they can trust the government has not once surpassed 30 percent. The most recent results from April of this year show that confidence in the government stands at 20 percent, near a histor historic low. The alienation of younger generations is not a new phenomenon. Uh, at the height of the uproar over the Vietnam War, Church observed, quote, we are left confronted with the indisputable fact that a substantial proportion of our college students are estranged. They portray a poignant, visceral sense of alienation towards the establishment by which they mean all authority that stands for or somehow represents the government. But this moment feels different. For one, we are not involved in a conflict like Vietnam, where the government drafted thousands of unwilling young Americans to fight in a war they didn't believe in. The prevailing sentiment among younger generations today seem to skew more towards distrust and cynicism rather than outrage. Younger generations decreasingly believe that the government and its institutions are working in their best interests, and they are opting out. So why have our citizens lost confidence in democracy? Experts have several theories. One line of argument contends that the public has become disillusioned by the vast sums of money influencing politics, and they have a point. The direct political spending at the federal level represented at a bare min minimum $16 billion during the last most recent election cycle. About $6.4 billion was spent on the elections themselves. Another $6.4 billion went towards lobbying the federal government. The remaining $3.2 billion funded partisan think tanks and advertising on political TV shows. Some contend that the economic disruption, particularly economic inequality, has undermined people's faith in democracy to solve deep-rooted problems. Changing migration patterns, shifting demographics have upended many communities, causing them to turn inward to slow the pace of change. What is undeniable is that public indices of disenchantment, including the growing popularity of anti-establishment parties, are on the rise. One alarming study found that among young Americans, the proportion who expressed approval for a, quote, army rule, as opposed to democracy, rose from 1 in 16 in 1995 to 1 in 6 in the most recent survey. 
a few years ago. As identity politics have taken root, this has led to a corresponding erosion of traditions of tolerance and diversity. The Southern Poverty Law Center called 2016 an unprecedented year for hate. And the, st the statistics back up that assertion. The number of Muslim anti-Muslim hate groups tripled last year from 34 to 101. The number of hate crimes against Muslims spiked 67% in that same period. Likewise, our view on Im immigrants and refugees is also changing. Consider for a moment that over 65 million people are currently displaced uh, through war and conflict. 22.5 million of them are officially classified as refugees who are seeking safety across international borders. Over half this number of children, and this represents the highest total since World War II. Yet, we are slashing the number of admit admitted refugees. The latest proposal from Trump would drop levels below 50,000. I don't understand this logic. The line from the White House is that our country cannot afford the economic cost of refugees. And yet, the New York Times reported just yesterday that the administration suppressed a study from the Department of, of Health and Human Services, which found that refugee, refugees brought in $63 billion more in government revenue uh, over the past decade than they cost. So if cost isn't the real issue, what is? I can't wait to hear the next round of, of obfuscations about why capping our generation is of the utmost importance. Under President Obama, the refugee cap st stood at 110,000. In my opinion, 110,000 was shamefully low. We should have tripled that number, and that still would have not have been enough. Countries like Germany and Sweden are shouldering much heavier burdens. In 2015 alone, Germany took in nearly 890,000 refugees. Of course, that's also not to mention the recent decision to end the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, betraying the hopes and dreams of 800,000 young people who, as President Obama described them, are here through no fault of their own, who pose no threat, who are, taking away, who are not taking away anything from the rest of us. The next challenge we face relates to environmental disruption brought on by climate change. Last month, we met a group of friends in Stanley. Uh, they had first flown to Bozeman to attend a wedding and afterwards drove from Montana over the Bridger Mountains uh, through to Idaho. As they talked about the trip, they described acres upon acres of dead forests, trees that had been stripped of all foliage, leaves that had an eerie reddish-brown hue to them. We were stunned by the description, and I did a little research. It turns out that my friends had witnessed the effects of the mountain pine beetle. Since the 1990s, more than 60 million acres of pine forest from New Mexico to British Columbia have suffered die-offs. Three quarters of the mature white bark pines in Yellowstone are dead because of the beetles. British Columbia is the latest to fall victim. By the time the epidemic ends, 60% of its pines may be dead, totaling a billion cubic meters of wood. What has spurred the pine beetle? Rising temperatures brought on by climate change have simultane simultaneously boosted the beetle's population and weakened trees, trees uh, through drought. Accordingly, the trees are unable to withstand this insect invasion. And to, to me, this is just one example of the cataclysmic environmental changes occurring around the world. Uh, and yet, we are willfully denying, our leaders are willfully denying that the U.S. has any role or responsibility for confronting climate change. In a classic case of psychic numbing, we are burying our heads in the sand and wishing away the problem. Take our treatment of the Paris Climate Accord. The agreement itself is relatively weak. It, it is non-binding, doesn't go far enough to limit rises in temperature, and leaves it to individual countries to make hard choices. It is necessary, but it is not sufficient. The right thing to do would be to endorse the accord, but commit to bolder steps. Uh, instead, we have chosen to abandon the agreement, a treaty endorsed by every country around the world, save Nicaragua and, and Syria, uh, at a critical juncture. Towards what end? In fact, it is, ask, it is worth asking how climate change became a politicized issue in the first place. How did something as basic as ensuring our children have fresh air to breathe, clean water to drink, and a habitable environment to live in turn partisan? Back in the 2007 election, the Republican nominee, Senator John McCain, ran on climate credentials that were stronger than Barack Obama's. Uh, but after the Republicans lost the election, the ground shifted. A big impetus for the shift was triggered by the fossil fuel industry, notably Kansas billionaires Charles and David Koch. They came up with a deviously brilliant strategy with one goal in mind, take the science out of climate and turn it into a political issue. They ran attack ads. They made well-timed and generous campaign donations. They selectively targeted vulnerable incumbents in goal states. Their tactics succeeded, despite scientific consensus that concretely links the planet's warming to human activity. Leading to extraordinary fires in western states or 500-year hurricanes uh, in places like Texas, Florida, and the Caribbean. Even public opinion has shifted. Seven in 10 Americans now support strict carbon limits in coal-fired power plants. Large majorities believe climate change will harm Americans, just not themselves. 
Nonetheless, the oil and gas lobby continues to prevail and has made speaking out on climate change politically dangerous. In contrast, fighting to protect millions of acres of wilderness was a major legacy for Frank Church. He led the passage of three major environmental bills, the Wilderness Act of 1965, the Eastern Wilderness Act of 1974, and the Endangered American Wilderness Act of 1978. And doubtless, some of the folks in the room here uh, were actively working on that on behalf of Frank Church. Working hand in hand with another Idaho icon, the late Governor Cecil Andrus, they successfully set aside millions of acres of, uh, of protected land in central Idaho. I think this quote from Frank Church about the importance of preserving the wilderness is as relevant today as it was in 1977. Quote, though we tend to feel that we are presently the owners of this country, we are not in any true philosophical sense. We are the trustees of this country for a little time only. I never knew a man who took a bedroll onto an Idaho mountainside and slept there under a star-studded summer sky who felt self-important the next morning. Unless we preserve some opportunity for future generations to have the same experience, we shall have dishonored our trust to posterity. The third issue I'd like to discuss is the decreasing stature and influence of the US on the world stage. So just yesterday, Trump took the podium at the UN and he promised a few things. He promised to totally destroy North Korea, crush loser terrorists, and to cry that major parts of the world are going to hell. I actually went through the transcript to specifically look through uh, some of the terminology. Never in my lifetime did I expect to hear the President of the United States utter such language in a formal setting in front of world leaders. The United States has traditionally stood for something greater than merely, preser merely preserving power or pursuing economic interests. Our founding principles that citizens have the right to express themselves, associate freely, worship as they choose, and participate in their political systems have inspired people globally. In fact, advancing democracy and protecting human rights are at the heart of American soft power. So when Joe Nye coined the term soft power in 1990, he observed, if a state can make its power seem legitimate in the eyes of others, it will encounter less resistance to its wishes. In other words, protecting human rights and advancing democracy are not only moral imperatives, uh, they are key planks of US power and legitimacy. These values provide Washington with the credibility to persuade other countries to follow its lead and conform to our interests without resorting to force. Frank Church recognized this principle as well, saying, the greatest danger to our democracy, I dare say, is not that the communists will destroy it, but that we will betray it by the very means chosen to defend it. Foreign policy is not and cannot be permitted to become an end in itself. It is rather a means towards an end, which in our case is not only the, only the safety of the United States, but the preservation of her democratic values. So far, what have we seen under President Trump? First, human rights are out, authoritarians and dictators are in. Trump's first visit abroad was not to a Western liberal ally. He chose to stop in Saudi Arabia, an absolute monarchy with an appalling human rights record. The Saudis are leading a bombing campaign in Yemen that has struck hospitals and schools and killed scores of innocent civilians, potentially amounting to war crimes. He has met with Filipino President Rodrigo Duterte and offered him a White House invitation. Since Duterte assumed office, he has unleashed death squads under the guise of fighting narcotics. Thus far, over 7,000 people have been killed in his campaign. Trump has welcomed Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi to the White House. Al-Sisi has authorized a brutal crackdown by his security forces involving mass incarceration, torture, and forced disappearances and extrajudicial killings. But we are not just embracing rogues and dictators. In the fight against ISIS, we have taken military actions that are raising alarm bells. For example, civilian casualties in Syria and Iraq due to coalition airstrikes are on pace to double under Trump. Through July, U.S. bombings and airstrikes have killed over 2,200 civilians. We are not talking about the legitimate deaths of enemy combatants and terrorists. These are innocent children, families, and ordinary people who have been killed by U.S. bombs. While some level uh, of civilian harm is an inevitable byproduct of war, a doubling of civilian deaths, month after month, points to a more sinister pattern. This matters because killing civilians is morally unacceptable and violates international humanitarian law. Killing civilians is strategically self-defeating. It turns populations against us and makes harder, uh, victory harder to achieve. Killing civilians undermines our global standing. It alienates allies and foreign publics, undercuts our legitimacy, and undermines our influence. Second, our inconsistency and abdication of leadership at key moments this year have stunned our allies. When Trump announced that the U.S. would leave the Paris Climate Accords, this was not only damaging from an environmental perspective, it also signaled to the world that 70 years of international leadership were suddenly up for debate. In Trump's UN speech, 
He emphasized the concept of national sovereignty 21 times and reinforced his desire to take care of his own people rather than worry about the rest of the world. It has not also helped matters that Trump has refused for months to reaffirm Article 5 in NATO, the core tenet relating to collective self-defense. Unsurprisingly, foreign leaders are increasingly vocal in their criticism of U.S. leadership. After the, the events in Charlottesville and Trump's equivocation about who was responsible for the violence, German Prime Minister Angela Merkel did not mince words. Quote, it is racist, far-right violence, and clear forceful action must be taken against it, regardless of where in the world it happens. Clearly alluding to Trump, she reprimanded, what needs to be condemned is any form of violence, especially any forms of extreme or aggressive violence. Third, as a result, our influence and stature on the world stage is markedly declining. Alliances, alliances take years to build, but can be squandered in months, especially in the age of Twitter. Elliot Cohen, a former Republican official, offers a blistering critique. Already foreign leaders have begun to reshape alliances and reconfigure the networks that make up the global economy, he says, bypassing the United States and diminishing its standing. In almost every region of the world, the Trump administration has already left a mark by blunder, inattention, miscomprehension, or willfulness. I don't assume that Trump is willing or interested in shifting course. I expect more fumbling uh, under his watch. But I truly hope our country doesn't face a crisis of existential proportions. I do not believe that he has the temperament or intellect to make the right decisions with millions of lives at stake. But I also worry that over the long term, the damage will not be easy to overcome. As Canadian Foreign Minister Christia Freeland put it, the fact that our friend and ally has come to question the very worth of its mantle of global leadership puts into sharper focus the need for the rest of us to set our own clear and sovereign course. These actions and words will reverberate for years to come. For our allies who have spent more than half a century basing their identity and core national policies on America's open-ended promise uh, of, of, of open-ended support, Trump's election raises profound questions. Are ordinary Americans no longer committed to advancing democratic values and, uh, and upholding liberal alliances? Can the United States truly be relied upon in the future? So what can we do? How do we lead without a viable leader? I think we need to be clear-eyed and realistic about what, where things stand. We are not capable of providing consistent, credible leadership at this moment. Another country, perhaps Germany, will have to assume this mantle until we get our act together. That could be in four years or it could be longer. But we are too great a country with too much at stake to simply sit on the sidelines. The effects of climate change will only get worse. The fraying of our democracy will only deepen. But the virtue of a democracy, democracy is that one person, even someone as powerful as the president, cannot supplant the diversity, knowledge, and compassion of our broader population. I believe there are many actions we can undertake as individuals, both locally and nationally, that can make a difference. As a starting point, we should reaffirm the centrality of knowledge and evidence to our discourse. A recent Foreign Affairs article, How America Lost Faith in Expertise, observes, the biggest concern today is that Americans have reached a point where ignorance is seen as an actual virtue. To reject the advice of experts is to assert auto autonomy, a way for Americans to demonstrate their independence from nefarious elites and insulate their increasingly fragile egos from ever being told they're wrong. This has manifested itself in countless harmful ways. The anti-vaccine movement is a good case in point. Climate change denialism is another. Part of the problem is that people are less interested in evidence and more focused on rejecting vaccines or denying climate change because it expresses who they are. Daniel Patrick Moynihan's famous line, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you are not entitled to your own facts, is more important than ever in these divided times. Second, we must hold our politicians, representatives, and government agencies accountable. I'm certain you've heard this before, but it is important to emphasize our individual civic responsibility. We must remember it every day and act on it. Our Constitution provides numerous checks and balances on power. The President represents but one level of authority. There is an even greater imperative to press our congressmen and senators to be vigorous in their oversight, to push back against bad policies, and to call out the President when he says something irresponsible or does something reckless. We cannot give in to apathy and indifference, and I worry about younger generations that are moving away from public service and civic engagement. We have many problems that require urgent attention, and they will not get solved by turning inwards and hiding in smartphones and social media feeds. Citizens must get involved, attend city council meetings, run for office, volunteer for a local refugee resettlement organization, attend a protest, attend another protest, write to your senator, go to one of their town hall meetings, and make your voice heard. Let me provide a couple concrete examples of ways you can make a difference right after you leave this lecture. I learned last week at the Idaho 
uh, environmental forum about a proposal from Canadian mining company Mines Gold to dig an open pit mine under the riverbed of the East Fork South Fork headwaters of the Salmon River. The potential effects are chilling. This small area provides the most important remaining habitat for summer Chinook salmon in the Columbia River Basin. That project, if approved, would destroy a bull trout spawning area and store toxic mine tailings in the dam right on the river. So this is where the fight begins, in our own backyard. Frank Church spent years of his life struggling to protect Idaho's wilderness. It is up to us to carry on this legacy and do the same. What can you do? Contact the Idaho Conservation League, request meetings with your local and congressional representatives, organize a petition, seek an audience with Midas Gold. Here's another example. While violence is perpetrated by extreme right-wing groups is tragically on the rise, I don't believe the right answer is to fight violence with violence like Antifa activists are doing. But I firmly believe that positive action can send a strong message back to communities of hate and bigotry. To that end, you could volunteer your time in a refugee resettlement organization like the International Rescue Committee, uh, or even a local nonprofit like Welcome Housing, which provides affordable housing options for newly arrived refugees. Or you could attend next week's teach-in hosted by the Maryland Schuler Human Rights Initiative, which is taking place September 28th at the University Library. There are many great organizations close to home that need your time, energy, ideas, and resources. Third, in the spirit of never letting a good political crisis go to waste, use this tumultuous moment to push for bigger, bolder change. Earlier this month, two Harvard business professors released a report about reforming our political system. They characterized that US politics as dominated by a duopoly. They observed that our system has two entrenched political parties, insulated them, which are insulated from pressure to serve constituents better and protected from new competition. They suggest a number of reforms, some of which are very doable. One idea they propose is the, quote, the govern for California approach. So this model leverages private philanthropy to support candidates based on strict governance and performance criteria, criteria regardless of party membership or ideology. To so focus on the performance and focus on what they'll, they will accomplish, don't focus on ideology. Breaking the two-party party lock on power and changing incentives so that candidates are rewarded for adopting centrist positions is an idea worth exploring. In fact, consider the following. Why not establish an ad hoc Western political coalition comprised of Democrats and Republicans? Such a coalition could include progressive ideas from leaders like Church and Andrus, as well as conservative principles from contemporaries like John McCain and Jeff Flake. The idea behind this coalition would be to come up with common sense, practical, and sensible policies in order to solve difficult problems, break, uh, break political gridlock, and get things done. The coalitions that Frank Church built to protect public lands and pass landmark environmental legislation are instructive. As he relates, back in the 1970s, an ad hoc committee of conservationists and lumber industry representatives was convened by the American Forestry Association. Its purpose was to identify areas of agreement. The concept is a good one because it puts diverse groups to work side by side, searching for consensus on matters they do agree upon. And in addition, by helping build a common effort to get more from our forests, it helps reduce the polarization that so often boxes us down. Drawing from my own experience in the Senate, I can attest that my colleagues on both sides genuinely wanted to enact good laws to benefit the country. I worked on countless bills with Republican colleagues from Senator Luger's office and Senator Corker's offices. I believe the spirit of bipartisanship still exists, although it's harder to find. But if we make an explicit commitment to resuscitate this legacy, build coalitions to solve common problems, and create political inevitability on the right issues, this can lead to a lot of good. America is a resilient country. In the darkest moments of the 60s and 70s, Church and his cohorts feared we were on the brink of nuclear catastrophe. The specter of the Soviet Union gleamed sharply. Riots tore through the streets of our cities. It felt like the country was engaged in a never-ending battle with itself. Somehow we put the pieces back together and forged ahead. Though I am clearly concerned by the myriad challenges of our time, I am also confident that we will get through this latest period of turbulence. I want to end with a final thought. I mentioned in the beginning that we have a 15-month-old son a uh, baby, and being a parent makes me view the future both with hope uh, and with worry. I am distressed about the scope of the challenges that I've laid out before you. But I harbor many doubts about whether, about whether we are willing to make the hard choices necessary to confront our deepest divisions and tackle, tackle our gravest environmental challenges. But for my son's sake, I st steadfastly continue to have faith and optimism in our country. We cannot wall ourselves from the world and leave problems for someone else to solve. We cannot afford to retreat into a bubble, either as Idahoans 
or Americans just because our relative privilege allows us to. We have a moral obligation to confront our deepest divisions and our gravest issues, both at home and abroad. Frank Church said how urgent it is for us to demonstrate to all the watching world that democracy has the will to serve vital public needs. Let that be a reminder to all of us of our obligations and duties as citizens of this great nation. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take your questions. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I mean, I, I think that's a, a really good point. Uh, and I think it certainly speaks to the volatility of our times and the volatility of our leadership in particular. Uh, you know, one of the points that I've emphasized a lot, and I've spoken on North Korea a few times, uh, is that now more than ever, having a consistent message uh, and one that assures our allies in particular, especially those who are in the crosshairs, is of, of the utmost importance. Uh, that there's a, a moment where uh, spouting off on Twitter uh, is within the realms of acceptability, especially in the political context. And there are other moments where having the discipline uh, to have uh, a, message, a message of reassurance is, is critical to our national security. And so I think this, this uh, uh, is a good, is very emblematic of that issue. Uh, and, and given especially what we heard from President Trump in the UN yesterday, uh, I don't know exactly what that indicates. I don't know how much of that is bluster. I, I hope that we are not uh, closer to war in a way that it seems to indicate that is just more of a larger, larger rhetoric as opposed to something behind it. Uh, but certainly if I was living in Japan or Seoul uh, or Guam or somewhere else in the region, uh, I would, I would uh, have a lot of anxiety. Yeah? Do you think there's any chance Trump will finish his term? <laughs> well, that's not really for me to, to answer. And I, I think our, uh, the, uh, Evan Osnos, who, uh, a New Yorker writer who did a, a really good talk in front of 700 people here in Boise uh, on Friday has an interesting article that, that explores uh, issues of impeachment or whatnot. Uh, I think a lot will, will sort of depend on where the Mueller uh, investigation first and foremost goes. Um, it seems to be entering a new phase where uh, potential indictments and other uh, kind of subpoenas are, are moving uh, ahead. So, you know, uh, I, I mean, one thing that's instructive, I think, is that in other moments of stress politically, uh, in our country, uh, thinking about Watergate and Nixon, uh, at a snapshot in time prior to when uh, uh, impeachment was threatened and before Nixon's resignation, uh, a lot of people also felt that uh, it was unclear exactly where things would go. And I think a lot of people, including uh, uh, Woodward and Bernstein, uh, were actually um, did, never predicted that what they had uncovered would lead to the unraveling and the, and the resignation of a president. And so we could certainly be in another moment like that, where not knowing all the facts, uh, not knowing uh, where these investigations will lead, and not knowing the depth of support necessarily among the base and among others in the Republican Party, uh, what steps uh, and what actions and decisions they'll take, I think, it, I think there's a lot to be seen. So that, that's as far as I'll, I'll go uh, on, on that issue. Um, but I, I think it certainly will be a lot to, to look and watch for in the fall. Yvonne. Just left the State Department. Perhaps you could give us a view about what the State Department's point of view is, what they're planning to do. I, I've been watching the Vietnam, Vietnam documentary, mm. and there are so many parallels uh, to what you mentioned we're doing right now. Uh, lying, uh, customized facts, um, uh, hurting civilians, which ends up hurting civilians in those countries against us, uh, supporting the wrong governments, uh, demagogic governments. What is the, does the State Department see those parallels? Uh, are we doomed to keep repeating this? Mm -hmm. uh, what do they p see their role? What are they planning to mm -hmm. do to avoid some of the same mistakes we made? Mm -hmm. 
Thanks, Yvonne. That's, that's, a, that's a really great question. Um, and, and I think, you know, the State Department has generally been a, a, a place where uh, more deliberation and putting the brakes on the worst policies is something that can happen. Um, and it's been a, a real honor and privilege to serve in the State Department. Um, but my concern right now, which speaks to your point, is that we don't have the capacity in the State Department currently to actually push back against the policies that are most distressing and disturbing when it comes to our stature and it comes to our national security abroad. Uh, and I think that speaks to a few things. Th uh, first of all, a large amount of the policy making is centralized and taking place in the White House, period. Uh, the State Department was slow to get off the ground. It is still slow to get off the ground. Uh, we have a relatively weak Secretary of State who, who clearly has less and less of the confidence of the president, and he certainly seems to have less and less confidence in the president as well, so it kind of goes both ways. Uh, and, and so we're seeing a large number of decisions that are kind of that are either centralized in the White House, or when it comes to the military action, even something different is happening, which is the delegation down of authority. So in other words, when it comes to making decisions on airstrikes, uh, where, where civilians are located, and, and what uh, types of, of um, choices to make, uh, these are decisions that are being made in the field. There's very little oversight from Washington. Um, we're seeing the military essentially run the entire apparatus. Now, I have a tremendous amount of uh, respect for the military, uh, but I think they would be the first ones to say that having robust and vigorous civilian oversight is an important part of, of the functioning and leadership of this country. And so when you leave it up to them to make decisions, but you generally use a bullying and aggressive tone when it comes to defeating your adversaries, that sends a clear message to the military about what's important and what's not. And so that's another issue uh, that's coming to the fore. I think the final thing I would mention is that I talk to colleagues at the State Department all the time. In fact, I spoke to an old colleague yesterday for over an hour. Um, and, and, you know, uh, some will say that, um, well, Secretary of State Tillerson has faced a lot of criticism, and I think a lot of it is sadly warranted. I mean, he has said that his number one priority is bringing about more efficiencies in the State Department. Now, that's fine. I think there's nothing wrong with organizational reform. Uh, but for that to be your number one priority and to not think about the substantive policy goals of the country and our national security is something that worries me deeply. Not to mention the fact that we are not nominating people in the State Department to actually do the jobs that are necessary. We lack assistant secretaries. We lack ambassadors. We lack the point people to talk to other parts of the world, engage, and through diplomacy find solutions to tough problems, like North Korea, uh, like Russia, and like many other uh, issues. So I, I think, I, I mean, I'm worried. I think there's a lot of, there aren't a lot of people home at the moment at the State Department. Uh, it's been purposely neutered in some ways by the White House, and, and what the White House hasn't done uh, through poor leadership by Tillerson, uh, that's being completed. Now, I know Chase uh, had, is Chase here? Yeah, there you are. You said you had one or two questions from social media you wanted to, nothing yet. Then let's go back to the, we'll, we'll go back to the audience. Maybe someone will come. Tom. I appreciate the vigor of your remarks and the um, actionable items at the end. The startling statistic to me was that trust in government was somewhere south of 30%. Yeah. Is that a bottom out figure, or you know, what trends do you see, and what can the school yeah. public service do? <laughs> uh, well, um, so this came, comes from the Pew, Pew uh, uh, polling. Um, and, and what's interesting, it, it, has, it is a figure that's kind of gone up and down at different moments um, uh, in our history. I mean, generally, there's been sort of a downward trend uh, since the since the 70s in terms of uh, different moments. Now, in during Reagan's years, there was a spike. Um, after 9/11, there was another spike, but then since then, it's sort of gone down uh, significantly. So we're seeing kind of a topsy-turvy amount based on certain political moments that we're in, but the overall uh, sort of trajectory of that number has been down. And so while uh, I think 20% is not complete rock bottom, um, it's, uh, it's near, it's close to it. Um, so I, I think it's, it's worrisome. And, and, and you know, from a, from a Frank Church Institute School of Public Service perspective, uh, I would actually like to bring out um, the folks who put together the, this poll uh, out to Boise State University uh, in the spring, um, several of whom I know very well, and, and to have them unpack the numbers and, and give us more granularity uh, about some of the different surveys that, that they're either running or are planning to run. So I think more to come on that. Me is that it's still 30%. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's 20% now. Yeah. Andre, because that's about where Trump's support base is 30 to 35%. 
And the concern I have is that the administration is uh, disproportionately playing to the 30% of the 35% that's its base as opposed to reaching out to the 60, 60 or 65% or 70% that they've already lost or are losing, uh, that have points of view that if embraced, considered, uh, and intelligently responded to, would be both in the national interest and in Trump's parochial political interest in terms of dropping that 30%. Yeah. And I don't see that process happening. It's the first president in my lifetime uh, who has not understood that you accept the base and try to convert the rest as opposed to offend the rest and narrow the base. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you can govern effectively if that's your philosophy. Right. No, I think it's a great point. Frankly, he's not governing effectively. Uh, if you look at legislation, uh, if you look at sort of basic uh, things, uh, when it comes to uh, running uh, a government administration, running agencies, you're not seeing very much happen at all. And so that, that's part of it, although some would argue that you know, the deconstruction of the, the administration, of the administrative state, which was sort of Bannon, Steve Bannon's professed goal, is part of that. And so if the project is, let's make government work uh, ineffectively because we don't need it to begin with, maybe that's something in a very strange, perverse way that actually uh, is being successful. But I would say actually there's one point that kind of struck me is that on the one hand, we can pin a lot of the problems when it comes to division and polarization on Trump. Uh, and we can say, you know, his rhetoric in the wake of Charlottesville, uh, his alienation uh, when it comes to uh, diversity, uh, when it comes to his perspective on immigration and migration, that these are all things that uh, he has done to exacerbate a divide or create a divide and that he's only playing to the base. Uh, but I think the other thing we have to, to think very carefully about is that these divisions existed before, that Trump was elected by 49 million people, and he certainly didn't hide what his ideology was or lack of ideology was when it came to building a wall, when it came to many of the other issues that we find so hurtful and divisive. Uh, I think we do have to take a harder look uh, at some of the, the numbers that we're looking at when it comes to disenchantment with our democracy prior to Trump, when it comes to people not believing in institutions or thinking that Congress uh, is, has very little to do when it comes to actually affecting and improving their daily lives. Uh, I think there is a broader uh, amount of disillusionment when it comes to the role of public service, and that's something that, we, that absolutely needs to change, I think, for the good of this country. But right now, that's been a free fall, and I think Trump is exacerbating the worst aspects of that. But I think if we, if we simply look past Trump and say, wait till the next election, or wait till the midterms, we'll get someone more reasonable, and then we'll be back on course, I think that's probably missing the larger point and trends that we're seeing. And so that's one of the things that I, I think it, it, that, that we, we should all think about that I would like to research more and understand better when it comes to the broader polarization that I think represents a, a longer-term trend. Dr. Steve, I have a question about the loyal opposition. Uh, namely, where is it? But uh, just to put it in context, it, uh, a, a century ago, or last century, you had uh, a governor of California spend probably years and years training for the presidency. I mean, Reagan was all over this country as a thought leader for the Republican Party on the banquet circuit and in governing the state of California. So by 1980 comes along, this guy's ready to assume the mantle of the presidency. Meanwhile, uh, we're almost a year into this new presidency here, and I can't find, I can't find where the leadership of the loyal opposition is. I, you mentioned uh, Kane, McCain, and and um, and Jeff uh, Jeff Flake, yeah. Flake. Uh, throw in Kasich for good measure on the Republican side, although they're all freaked out by the Trump base. Mm -hmm. But where where are the Democrats? Where are the Democrats? And put Pelosi and Schumer aside as busy in Washington and not very relevant to what comes next anyhow. Well, where is the Democratic leadership? Why aren't they stepping up? Why aren't they speaking out? Why aren't they providing some semblance of shadow government the way parliamentary systems seem to be able to pull it off? Yeah, yeah. No, thank you, Dr. Kustra. I think, I think it's a great point. Um, and, you know, one, one thing I can point to is that I think there's still I would point to two factors. I think one of them is that there's, there's a big internal debate taking place among liberals and among the Democrats about what exactly went wrong 
in the last election and whether to pivot in a much harder way uh, to embrace uh, left, more, more left-leaning progressive policies. Uh, and so that's sort of like the Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren wing versus sort of the more moderate centrist types who, you know, frankly, with Hillary's loss uh, and her loss to someone of the caliber of Trump, I think has that whole centrist part of the Democratic Party uh, at least sort of hiding for a while. Now, whether they reemerge and whether there's a passion among the Democratic base to actually embrace that, I'm not sure. But I think right now there's the makings of, of a big divisive argument. Uh, and it probably needs to happen in a more explicit way. I think before a real leadership can happen uh, and, and a more coherent message occurs, some consensus needs to occur within the party itself uh, and among the, the broader electorate there about what, what the, the Democratic Party stands for and whether it is something that's more centrist, moderate, and bipartisan nature, or whether you sort of emulate what a large part of the Republican Party has, has done, which is sort of double down on the base. Um, so that's, that's sort of, I think, one aspect, too. The other thing is that you know, we have seen the slow deterioration of the Democratic Party in terms of its access, uh, in terms of its political power at all levels for over a decade. Uh, and and you know, one, one of the things that gives parties and, and politicians the ability to speak out is to actually have a perch in which to, to use, whether it's governorships or, Senate, or uh, being a senator or a congressperson or so forth. But if you look at all levels, we're at, the Democratic Party is at its lowest ebb uh, almost historically. I think it's close to that. I was looking at some numbers the other day, but I think at this point they, they, have, they hold 16 governorships. Um, and, and with uh, Governor Jim Justice in West Virginia having recently switched over to the Republicans, that's either makes it 16 or 15. So th that there's, there's, there's something that's not resonating, uh, and there's something that hasn't worked in terms of a farm team and system to allow in a recruiting pipeline of young emerging leaders to actually lead these debates in a, in a, in a new direction. If you look at you know, the candidates that people are talking about potentially for 2020, Many of them are in their 60s and 70s, and they represent sort of an, an older generation of thinking among Democrats. Well, where is the fresh energy uh, that, will, that will sort of break through some of that? I think th those are all questions that need to be explored. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder if you comment what I guess I see as an alarming trend from the State Department going on now. And you alluded to some of that already. I mean, ambassadors aren't being appointed. Undersecretaries aren't even being considered. Jobs are being taken away. Uh, programs are being cut or else eliminated entirely. Now, how, how is the State Department going to function in the world without having, you know, the base of those experienced people on the ground who know the areas that they, they <coughs> serve, they know the languages, they know the customs and cultures? Where's that going to go? Yeah. Well, I mean, I I fully agree with, with what you said. You know, it was an interesting thing. I was talking to my colleague yesterday, and he was talking to me about they have these senior staff meetings that they do twice or three times a week that involves every single kind of key assistant secretary or undersecretary. Uh, it's a small meeting that uh, meets with the secretary of state. And it's where you sort of lay out and plan uh, different policy issues that are coming up uh, during the course of that week. Uh, so normally there's about 40 people or so uh, um, who attend those meetings. So he, he mentioned to me, he said, you know, after January 20th, when there was a changeover, right, so some of the politicals had left at that point, including myself, uh, you had 40 people in the room then who were sort of a lot of, a lot of whom were either act in an acting capacity but represented um, sort of the institutional knowledge of Foreign Service officers and, and so forth, very senior, very credible people. He said the turnover since that meeting and today, when going into, uh, into a senior staff meeting, so the, the, oh, there's only about three people left of that original group, right? And this is not a political group. This is not the Democrats who are kicked out. This is post-January uh, 20th. So that tells you something about institutionally what's happening to our most senior officials in the Foreign Service and Civil Service and what they're choosing to do. I think that's a gap that's going to be incredibly difficult to fill. Uh, you know. And, and on the one hand, you can make an argument uh, that having a bit of churn can be a good thing for an organization in terms of bringing to the fore new ideas and giving promotion opportunities to people. But what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing, is not just the top people who are leaving, it's other uh, levels as well that are kind of filtering out and looking for other opportunities. And so if you hollow out the top and you hollow out the middle, um, two things will happen. A, you'll lose your capacity, so you'll have very little. You won't be able to handle the daily functions. But B, that vacuum will be seized by some 
other entity, whether it's uh, DOD, whether it's the White House, uh, or whether it's just lack of uh, engagement on the diplomatic front, period. Um, so these are real concerns. And I, I, think, I, think, I think the current Secretary of State uh, has not done us any favors in terms of at least retaining the people who would otherwise stay, who may not be happy with the president's policies, but would serve their country and, and do so because it's the right thing to do. And it's, and it's a, a part of the oath that you swear in when you become a foreign service officer. I think because of their dissatisfaction with his leadership, we're seeing an even greater amount, a uh, greater exodus than we otherwise would. Uh, and I, I, I think it'll be really hard to make that up uh, in the future. So I don't have a good answer to you, but I think it's really, I think it's very, very relevant. Chase. Yeah, here's one from Twitter. A follower says, how can we get our own legislators to engage their communities better on the topics you discussed? He said, it's like pulling teeth to get them make, to make public appearances, especially Jim Rich. <laughs> well, here, here's my perspective when it comes generally uh, to the functions that our senators, representatives uh, ought to hold, uh, which is that you know, they are elected uh, by people. They face elections. Um, they have a responsibility to uphold the, uh, the roles uh, of the office, and that if they're not uh, adhering to that, then let elections be one means of accountability. But you know, we don't have to stop and wait for an election either. Uh, I think any representative who refuses to hold town halls, who doesn't engage with the constituent population, I think there are many ways to make your voices heard. Certainly they have offices uh, in the Senate, uh, each one of them, they're public offices, anyone can go in. So you're more than welcome to seek uh, as constituents meetings with them, either in their home district offices here, or if you happen to be going to Washington, in their Washington offices as well. Uh, you know, I saw when I worked in the Senate, plenty of, of people coming in, coming out, protesting outside the Senate, uh, seeking meetings, petitioning, writing letters. Um, there's a lot of means at our disposal to hold our representatives accountable uh, for, for what they are meant to do in their jobs. And I think being creative with that and thinking about that is something that uh, we need to take, put more energy into. I don't think it's good enough just to say, wait for an election, but I do think elections are there for a reason as well. So I think that's something, something to think about. I mean, even if you ideologically believed in the same things as one of the representatives, wouldn't you want to hear them talk and, and, and ensure that they're responding to your needs? You know, I, I, to, to me, it's just a basic function of doing your job. Yeah. I, I was in uh, Sweden uh, in the spring at a conference, and two of the panel members on one of the panels were Europeans who had worked in the U.S. for a long time, and they were talking about their concern for American democracy, the point you phrase. And they did, said that there are three things that drove that concern. One was Citizens United, the other was gerrymandering, mm -hmm. and the third was voter suppression. And when you look at the path the Supreme Court is on, it looks like they're headed towards enshrining those uh, concerns in constitutional rights. Uh, if they do that, it's hard to be optimistic of American democracy. Yeah, no, I, I, well, I think all three of those issues are salient, and you can already see the effects, uh, you know, Citizens United, in terms of the, uh, the amount of money uh, that has uh, gone into politics, especially uh, soft money, money from PACs, money that, that is not traceable. Uh, I think that's something that has had a really pernicious effect when it comes to our politics. And you know, what's interesting is that some might counter and say, well, if you look at the last presidential election, the amount of money that Hillary Clinton raised versus Donald Trump was uh, exponentially higher. And so therefore, that sort of obviates how much money does play a role when it comes to kind of uh, bigger level, level decisions. And I think, I think that's an anomaly. And I also think that you have to think about money on many different levels in terms of many different decisions, especially when it comes to special interests. Uh, as I described, you know, the Koch brothers campaign on, in terms of oil and gas drilling and how that uh, links into an anti-climate change agenda in the Republicans, that's not an accident. I mean, that comes from a deliberate amount of use of resources to accomplish a specific goal, which happens to coincide directly with uh, the industrial, the industry objectives of those individuals. I mean, this was an investigative piece that I uh, read uh, in several sources, including the New York Times. Um, and and this, this sort of, I think, is emblematic of that. I think the gerrymandering issue is also an interesting one. It is something that uh, has been sort of part of the historical tradition 
politically of the United States. Um, but I think it's extremely concerning uh, in terms of, you know, if we actually are interested in, in seeing politically competitive districts and ones where uh, uh, you'll find uh, a moderate voice potentially winning out, it's impossible to do that with the state of our gerrymandered districts. Uh, it, it encourages polarization. It encourages uh, playing to a, a, an extreme base on both ends. And so when you elect representatives uh, who come in, whose mandate from those particular voters is to be as fearful and ideological a defender as possible of those ideas, how do you then build back in that middle and get things done in a practical, in a practical way? And if, and if we don't solve that issue, then we're not going to restore faith to a democracy. We're not going uh, to demonstrate to another generation that it's worth investing their time there. And that's where I worry. So I, I think gerrymandering, if I had to pick you know, one of those uh, issues that you, you pointed to, uh, I think gerrymandering is something that for the future uh, has even more impact than, than uh, the, the sort of money in politics. There might be hope on Citizens United that the pendulum may swing, swing a bit now that you read post Koch Brothers. Now we have Robert Mercer, who is pouring money into the campaign against Jeff Flake, He's pouring money into against um, McConnell's favored candidate in Alabama. And all of a sudden, I think the Republicans may be looking and thinking it's not working out quite as well for them with the new Steve Bannon, uh, let's tear down the Republican Party yeah. troops going. So that's kind of an interesting uh, change to where where it was headed for a while. Yeah, no, I, I think that that could be something. And, and, you know, there's really two ways to kind of get at the issue, one of which is you find a legislative way uh, to to put up a, a new law that conforms to what the Supreme Court decisions have been on Citizens United, and you, you do that in a bipartisan manner. And we've seen that before in terms of McCain-Feingold. Right, and and maybe that's maybe you can build a consensus and, and turn things back. Uh, I mean, the other way is you look through Supreme Court uh, appointments, and you know there are a lot of decisions to be made, mostly among Republicans now, depending on when the next vacancy occurs, about what type of justice they want on there. And you know, if you get a, a Neil Gorsuch type, um, you know that that may not augur well. Yeah, Tony. Uh, Risk of sounding paranoid. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've heard some of the remarks, thoughts, comments about the, the counterintuitive uh, things that the president's doing with respect to um, uh, trying to broaden his appeal. Combined with the, um, the, the remarks several times uh, during this hour about the hollowing out of the State Department, while at the same time building up the military. Uh, uh, it, it occurs to me, and, and most of it coming out of the White House, it occurs to me that this may be intentional, uh, an intentional diminution of the State Department at the expense um, of, of the great diplomatic effort that we've always exerted over the, over the, the years, decades. Uh, it occurs to me that maybe somebody in the White House is, is orchestrating this that way. Do you have any feeling on that or any evidence that that? Well, you know, it certainly seems to be the strategy, whether it's deliberate or just happening through uh, poor leadership and, and other sorts of things. You know, there was a really good uh, interview, uh, actually, on, on NPR, I think yesterday, by, with Elliot Cohen, who I quoted here, who I just think has come out with another article kind of critical about sort of whether Rex Tillerson is the worst, uh, should resign or is the worst Secretary of State uh, in history. And, and one of the things that he kind of points to is just the fact that, um, you know, you are seeing kind of this, this movement where you know there's there's been such an intrinsic and instinctive uh, embrace of hard power by the president, both in terms of campaign rhetoric and and, and where he is now, uh, that there's sort of the natural flow is kind of going in that direction. And when you uh, systematically empower one uh, branch of the government uh, and provide you know a full amount of autonomy and actually uh, actually. Uh, you know, look at the budget, which I think is in many ways represents a real blueprint for where the government is going. And you look at kind of where the budget levels are as requested by the president for the military versus our diplomatic and foreign assistance sides. I mean, it does point to a series of priorities and choices, right? So, I mean, to me, it's, it's actually, it's, it's very explicit. Uh, it's pretty transparent in terms of where the preference is. Now, you know, 
I, I hope and I, and I think that in some ways uh, this president is also learning a little bit when it comes to the limits to what military power can do and the need to have some sort of consistent diplomatic effort. Um, you know, even despite the bluster that he's exhibited when it comes to North Korea, I mean, the fact of the matter is he's deeply frustrated. Uh, and I think the national security apparatus in general is deeply frustrated. There are no good military options. Any one of the potential uh, alternatives that are being considered, uh, anything from quick strike options uh, to uh, preemptive uh, bombings to decapitation, uh, they all uh, run uh, with extremely high costs uh, with the potential for millions of casualties. So ultimately, there is a diplomatic solution that needs to be found there. And on many of the other crises as well, whether it's Venezuela, which Trump also has spoken out about in the next two days, we're not going to invade Venezuela. It's not a, there's not a military solution. It makes no sense at all. Um, so you're going to have to find diplomacy, even if you've sort of systematically in the first nine months uh, diminished its stature uh, in a big way. So I, 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 think, I think there has to be a coming around. I just don't know exactly how that will, will occur. In the back? Yeah. Another cynical question. <laughs> I don't know if you saw uh, Tony. It's uh, sitting in my bag right now, and I've, I need to fully read, read through, but uh, I've, I've, I understand the basic argument without having yeah, read it through. So as I understand, the basic argument is actually Trump is um, not really like a, a, a new thing. Uh, I mean, it, it strikes us all as new because he breaks so many norms and is so unusual as a leader. But on the other hand, you could argue that he got a lot of American votes. Um, and then maybe he is the, the real American character, sort of come into power. So that's racism, that's sexism, that's dominance. So it's a cynical argument, right? Um, but I wonder what you make of arguments like that. That he's not, his base is not like some dark corner. They're actually central to who we are as Americans. I, I, I take him very seriously. Uh, you know, it, I think it goes back to the point that Trump is not in of himself someone who is who has personally ushered in. I think he's reflective and symptomatic of a broader set of trends that are disrupting our life and really kind of points to, I, I think there is a retrenchment that's happening simultaneously with a vast amount of innovation uh, occurring in this country. And I think any time you see that sort of cycle and turbulence of change, you're going to have a reaction to that that's negative in, in some respects. I think we've seen that historically in other periods as well, when sort of industrialization caught up to us, or uh, and and all of a sudden we sort of took a step backwards uh, and embraced uh, policies that were more xenophobic, restrictive, inward-looking uh, for a period of time. Um, I think a lot of people, uh, there are a lot of genuine, credible grievances there uh, that relate to a host of other factors that I think we ought to think about. I mean, you think about the opiate addiction; that's not a disconnected. Uh, thing you look at deindustrialization in the Midwest uh, in, uh, and in Appalachia, the movement away in terms of energy from coal to other sources. Uh, there is a large cohort where the current direction in which we're going, where it's not working for them. Um, I also think it's a cultural element too that that we need to think about uh, when it comes to why decisions were made uh, to vote for Trump versus uh, you know versus Hillary. Um, I've grappled a long time with this. I don't have any, any good, easy answers on that. Uh, but I do think it's more than just um, people obviously didn't vote uh, on their sort of pocketbook interests. A lot of people didn't. Uh, and a lot of it, I think, is a reaction to sort of elitism and to a perception that being told what to do from the coast and the big cities is not something that, that they feel is reflective of their own lives. I mean, part of the reason that... Uh, you know, I left Washington, uh, and I am in a state like Idaho, is that I would like to learn more and understand better where this sentiment comes from uh, and how we understand it in order to hopefully channel our country in a more positive direction, especially when it comes to the 49 million who feel that the current direction of President Obama and the other aspects to that, to, to his, uh, his tenure, were not working for them in a way that they were hoping. Uh, so I, I hope to learn. I mean, certainly this... Uh, is a state that voted heavily, heavily for Trump. That wasn't even, wasn't even contested, uh, and that it has gone in a particular political direction uh, for decades, although you have certain moments like Frank Church and Cecil Andrus uh, where, it's, um, where you've seen these, these flashes of progressivism. 
but generally speaking, the trend goes the other way. So um, I hope to learn more and understand better um, on what you're, what you're touching upon. You're in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we have one more and then we'll wrap up. Yeah. So what do you think that Trump could do domestically to increase his base, like he said he kind of needs to do? Because I think he does kind of face a dilemma, like he's doomed if he doesn't and he's doomed if he does with a lot of things. Like when it came to working with Schumer and Nancy Pelosi on the um, Dreamer Act or expanding the debt ceiling for the hurricane relief, like I just like, He's not getting good coverage no matter what he does. So what can he do to kind of expand his case? Yeah, well, you know, one of the things I think that is interesting is, let's say uh, that Trump actually genuinely started to adopt uh, some bipartisan approaches. Where would his base go exactly? Uh, would it just disappear? Uh, would they suddenly think that there's another person out there that who, who would better represent uh, the interests that he's articulated? I mean, I, I, I'm not so convinced that he's one deal away, one bipartisan move away from completely uh, losing that entire cohort. Uh, I mean, I think at the same time, the, the danger for him is that he does sort of two things in which that he, he pivots to the middle, but the middle doesn't trust him, uh, or certainly a large you know, portion of independents don't. He loses the enthusiasm of the base, and those two factors kind of sink him. So that's kind of the you know, if you were looking at it from a very sort of strictly a kind of political operative uh, perspective, that, that's where the, the difficulty lies. Uh, a normal politician uh, would try to, uh, to try to broaden out the middle, would keep the base happy on certain issues, uh, but would try to broaden out the middle and would try to combine those two to have a plurality that would lead to uh, uh, re-election. Because of the divisiveness and the unique nature of his own uh, presidency, uh, because frankly, for the, for, uh, many people have criticized and said he's the first independent American president who really isn't beholden to Republican orthodoxy uh, as much as it is something that helps uh, support and advance his self-interest. Uh, it's hard to say where that all goes, and it's hard to say exactly how you, one would chart an expansion of, of the base uh, and a move to the middle for Trump uh, over the next couple of years. I think, uh, I think that's it. So thank you all. <laughs> thank you for your time. I appreciate it.